Okay, crossing boundaries. Hyper-connected market services and apps. I'm going to start with and picking up the thread that's already come up twice today about technological change and using the same example of when we shift from buggies, horse-drawn buggies, to um, in what is effectively internal combustion engines replacing horses. And a couple of points have already been made, um, and I just want to make a couple of more points. The first is when we go through these technological changes, the frame of reference in our thinking is based on what we know today. And so the initial name for was horseless carriages for what we now know as the automobile. So it literally described what people saw, which was horses being replaced by engines. And it was called the horseless carriage. There's been discussion about red flag laws, which is incumbents passing legislation to slow down innovation. But one thing that wasn't that well mentioned was that the red flag laws had the effect of what we saw on the panel of shopping of jurisdiction. So particularly in continental Europe, the red flag laws that were passed in the UK led to the automobile and the locomotive industries shifting primarily to Germany and Austria. And UK uh, for many years was behind in developing automobiles and locomotives because of regulation. And that's what regulation and innovation, when they intersect, that's the problem. They shift to other countries. The other aspect of that was that every buggy manufacturer went out of business. It's not that they didn't try to adapt. So a lot of the business discussion is about continuously adapt to changing technology. That isn't easy. And every buggy manufacturer in the in United States went out of business except one, Studebaker, um, which did manage to adapt its business. So yes, businesses need to adapt to technology step changes, but it's actually pretty hard to do so. And there is huge wider societal impact from technology step changes. And the way we plan our cities, the way we think about commuting, the way we think we organize ourselves socially, a lot of this came from the simple fact where horses were replaced by the engine and buggies became cars and suddenly cars became something that everyone could use. That's what technology step changes does. And personally, we, or the uh, Swirl IO, which is the uh, company that I've co-founded, we back the blockchain much more than we back Bitcoin as a currency. I know that's not necessarily what you really want to hear, but it is a perspective that you need to think about. There's been a lot of discussion about what the blockchain is and it isn't, right? But we are most certainly convinced that more than anything, uh, the blockchain is the step change. And we've just started to understand its potential. And I've met a lot of people, even within the Bitcoin industry, who actually haven't quite understood what the blockchain is. I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time trying to explain to you what it is, but I would urge you, understand the blockchain, not only from its technical perspective, but the fact of it being a public ledger that is distributed, it is scalable, and just like the internet provided step change because it allowed communication uh, almost at zero cost between peers decentralized, blockchain allows computing and consensus by those nodes. And that's the point of the blockchain. But as we look around for the blockchain, and we look around at the blockchain being this wonderful hammer, and we've got these nails, and we're looking around for what nails do we want to, to target. We saw a list earlier today about blockchain 2.0 projects. And the problem with much of that thinking is that they're, they're starting from the blockchain. They're starting from saying, this is what the blockchain does. Wonderful hammer. Now what nails can I, where are the nails? What nails can I target? So we, the, the starting from the blockchain to look for, for problems to solve is a problem. We've got to turn that around. We've got to look at the wider context of computing and the wider context within which we exist today. And what's happened in, in the last decade is the wider context is around 
big data, multiple devices, privacy has become really important, transaction speed is really important, trust is hugely important. One of the biggest issues that we have with the internet computing infrastructure today is a lack of trust. We have a problem about identity and reputation. They are context specific and they are uh, not working for us in a connected world. And I'll talk more about the connected world because that's where I think the solution space is at the moment. And so if we think about what, I'm, what, we, what we mean by a connected world, you know, you look around, you've got a mobile phone in your pocket. Very quickly, wearables are taking off. We've got a lot of sensors in the machine-to-machine -machine Internet of Things happening. Uh, we've got a lot of devices. We've got interaction between those devices, laptops, uh, servers, everything. This huge amount of interaction happening. But, but each one of these is a silo. So I was talking to a friend of mine, and he says, why is it so hard for his playlist to be adopted and recognized by all the services? So why does he have to create a playlist that is separate for every device, every service, every place that he goes to? And what you start seeing is that we've got this connected world, but there are boundaries. Because every service, every device is looking at things from their context. So we've got things that are specific to devices and interfaces, personal data preferences, and that whole list of things there. Most important is context. One of our predictions is context is going to become one of the most important variables in a connected world. So as we get, uh, let's say, smart watches connected to a mobile phone, connected to your tablet, connected to your desktop, connected to your cloud agents, all of them talking and wondering, and all of them in silos. They lack context. They lack the ability to understand what's happening in a particular context. Now, these boundaries that exist in this connected world can be solved even today, one-on-one. -on -one. It's really hard to solve them, and that's why those boundaries continue to exist. And so what we are doing at Swirl, and where we started thinking about how do we think about the connected world, and we think about the blockchain, um, what we looked at was payments and, and the Bitcoin, whether it's a currency or a system, the payment system is only one part or one layer of what happens in a typical value exchange or an application or a service or anything that you do in life. So let me give you an example. Uh, you check it, you want to come and stay at a hotel in Queenstown for a conference. Now, there's a number of things that you have done and interacted with to find the hotel, book the hotel, come in and uh, register in the hotel, go to your room, maybe have things from the bar, and the payment that is done is a small fraction of that entire value chain. And so for Bitcoin and the blockchain to focus exclusively on the financial transaction that takes place misses that wider picture and that larger context. And to us, these are the layers that we look at. There's a communication network, which is essentially the internet um, and devices. There's the hypermedia, which is the World Wide Web, everything connected to everything else. And from the top, we have institutional networks and economic networks. That is where Bitcoin fits in. There's something that's missing in between. And to us, that's the contract network. And I'll talk more about what we're calling the C-Web, where C stands for computing and contracts. But the bigger picture and the bigger context here is a stack, a layer of markets, layers interacting with each other, of which payment and financials, even the larger financial applications that we're looking at in the Bitcoin industry, is just one layer in a value network that is the potential that our market space. So just uh, talking about the C-Web or the computing web, um, we look at it as an information-centric computing platform. And the easiest way that I describe this is we are truly beginning to transform the internet into one large abstract computer. For those of you who are technical, um, everything that is in the C-Web already exists. And that's what distinguishes it from many of the, of the Bitcoin 2.0 efforts, which are proprietary, use proprietary cryptocurrencies to run. We're talking about, and the reason why we call it the C-Web, 
is we believe we're following exactly what Tim Berners-Lee did with the World Wide Web, except his was a web of documents and ours is a web of computing. The only way for that to succeed is that it has to be open and free. It has to be open source. There has to be no payment required because there is no way the World Wide Web or the web as we know it today would be what it is if it wasn't open and free. If there was Tim Berners-Lee or CERN or somebody who had a patent or you had to pay royalty each time you use the web, it would be a fraction of what it is today. It has to be formally specified. This is one of the things that's missing a lot within the Bitcoin industry. We don't do formal specifications. We don't have theoretical proofs. It has to be specified so that we know that it works. And the main thing that we are building is what we call a transaction router, or router if you prefer. Uh, a transaction router is essentially a new piece that we're building that works at the application layer rather than at the network layer. And I won't get into a huge amount of technical details, but quite a bit of that. I'd love to share it with anybody who's interested. So I, I want to just sort of bring it back to a personal example, because it starts getting complex very quickly. Uh, the next Bitcoin South conference, this is what I'd like to be doing. I'd like to be me at the top. I've got a lot of devices, uh, multiple interfaces. And what we see happening more and more is that in the cloud or somewhere remote, there would be virtual assistants or virtual pieces of software, personal data stores running. And they're all interconnected, hyperconnected. So I decide to come to the next Bitcoin South conference. And I would have my devices and my agents. I need to only give them my preferences. Find me a hotel. This is the price range. These are the dates. It would go away and manage it. The key for the hotel would be automatically downloaded to my phone. Arrangements for taxi in my hometown and pickup in Queenstown would be automatically negotiated across boundaries. This is what we mean by crossing boundaries. Data crossing boundaries, orchestration across boundaries, context around boundaries. When I get to my hotel room, I already have the key on my phone. When I go inside, I would expect that my Sky TV channels, which for those who aren't from New Zealand, Sky TV is our monopoly cable uh, satellite and cable provider, why is it my Sky TV subscription available to me in my hotel room? Um, it's just an account that should be shifted across context. And we can have all of these crossing boundaries, all of these things interacting with each other, market service applications. They can all be done today, but it's really hard, really difficult. And that's what we think the future potential for the blockchain and this missing bit, which is the C-Web. So that's the essence of what we, the opportunity is not the blockchain on its own, but the blockchain removed from its confines within the Bitcoin or just thinking of it purely in the cryptocurrency context. But take the blockchain, add, it, add in distributed computing. And what we get is a whole new way of looking at connected devices. Again, for the technical people, what it, what it looked like is essentially um, the layers around the network, the application, and the semantics. So smart, contra uh, smart contracts in a more generalized form are called Ricardian contracts. So semantics, application, network. And what we would be looking at is working with developers and designers who are building these connected applications and would then use APIs to not have to worry about the rest. And I've only spoken about um, one example of connected microservices, but this computing platform, we've seen uh, application right across the spectrum, and that's the potential for the blockchain, is not only to look at financial or even um, ledger type activities, but right across information-centric information -centric computing is where that future lies. And just uh, 
I suppose finishing it off in terms of Swirl, which is the company that we've co-founded, our view is that we need to have C-Web, which is an open and free, and just like Tim Berners-Lee, we need to build um, example applications so that people understand and can see how it all works together. But ultimately, when we have a connected world and connected services, what will people pay for? So that's the challenge, uh, particularly when a lot of open source people is your core services are all open source, so how do you make money? And you have to think about where value lies. And we think value lies in trust, algorithmic trust in particular, which is a lot of data being collected, a lot, a lot of it being processed. Um, and so that's where the business model of Swirl is, which is essentially making it easier to test, design, and build these hyper-connected services. And for the Bitcoin industry, we think there's going to be hundreds of blockchains, public and private. And there would be need for companies like us who would be outsource providers of libraries, APIs, transaction processing, uh, analytics, and infrastructure. In terms of timeline, uh, we're working right now with our first customer on developing a prototype that would use the C-Web and the blockchain in the way that I've described so that we can explain and show how it all works together. Um, in the first quarter of next year, we'll have the frameworks and specifications. We're definitely keen to talk to anyone and everyone who's interested. Uh, hard concepts, hard to explain, um, but I think that as these discussions go, as we start building uh, applications, we'll start seeing more and more benefits. So that's the summary of what I wanted to talk about, that the blockchain is a great step change, but we just started scratching the surface. We definitely will not make progress if we think only of the blockchain in a limited financial or um, ledger type situation. It has to be combined with wider distributed computing systems. And if we can do that, then we have a whole new way of computing where the internet truly becomes an abstract computer. And just the way the blockchain benefits Bitcoin as cryptocurrencies, the blockchain starts benefiting computing as a whole. So uh, for those of you who are more interested, there's more about this at our website, swirl.io. And there's a white paper which describes the C-Web in far more detail, the information ecology connected applications at that particular link. Thank you, and I'll take questions now. Hello, that was a great presentation. So everything sounds great, and I'm sure everyone in the world would benefit. The issue that's going to come up is, how do we keep something like the NSA from just knowing completely everything you do? And more importantly, how do we convince people, the majority of people, that still believe that governments should have a back door to everything you just described? So um, the answer is that we need to design that in. Um, the one lesson from Edward Snowden is the only thing that works in that scenario is the maths, crypto. And uh, the essence of the C-Web is smart contracts, generalized, which is Ricardian contracts. So these are self-describing cryptographically signed contracts, which um, provide the basis of identity. It provides the basis of transactions and processes. And so, because of its decentralized nature, and you've got a transaction router that basically takes in information objects and moves them around, decentralized systems are really, really, really hard for anyone to spy on. Even if you do spy on them, crypto and the maths will do the job. But it's got to be designed in from day one. It can't be an add-on. And in fact, that is fundamentally the weakness of the internet. It was never designed with security built into it. Um, over here, uh, Vikram. 
Um, so a question about the most likely first applications of this. Um, I'm with you entirely. I think we've been talking about grid computing, cloud computing, and distributed computing, and not only payments, but um, uh, sequence ledgers and uh, recording contracts have always been the big missing link in realizing that dream. Um, it seems to me that one of the most easy to grasp, low-hanging fruit in that particular case are straightforward uh, distributed resource uh, computing. For example, either creating decentralized versions of Amazon Web Services, where the resources, uh, gigahertz, uh, gigabytes of storage, uh, etc., and network bandwidth are provided either by hosting providers or individuals, or networking mesh network services such as Wi-Fi and MadeSafe is, is often brought up as one example of using blockchain technologies to do resource allocation, tokenization, and reward systems. Um, do you see that as one of the first possible applications of something that is C-Web-like, where systems can allocate computing storage and network resources by Ricardian contracts or tokens uh, to implement this? I do, but in a different way. Um, I think there's already one or two really good examples of frameworks where the fundamental principle being uh, economics. So the cost of uh, computing and the cost of storage is falling faster than the cost of bandwidth. So as we scale from, say, 10 billion devices connected to the internet to 30 to 50 billion, the cloud computing model starts coming under strain because bandwidth becomes expensive. And so um, in any case, irrespective of anything else, I would certainly urge people to not think of cloud computing as the necessary and only computing model going forward. That's what the general opinion is, and it's wrong. Economics will force decentralization and moving computing power to the edge. Um, and so that's already happening. Where the C-Web is really strong is in transaction processing. And what I see that the C-Web will do is optimization of the edge based on transactions in real time, but not necessarily static AW, you know, Amazon type services. Right, is a better term for that mesh computing perhaps? Or it's completely peer to peer, right? So it's like my Android phone in my pocket providing computer services for someone else in this room. Uh, to execute a contract or something like that? It is, it is hyper-mesh in the sense mesh tends to have local connectivity and then through central hubs connect back to the internet. Um, we see everyone connecting to everyone in the sense that you have nodes in the blockchain that can connect to everyone. Um, and so you have these, you solve the Byzantine general's problem because um, the nodes don't trust each other. But the problem with the mesh is it's only local. And it's really difficult to build global meshes. But it's a hyper mesh, as it were. Um, hi. Uh, so the way I understand what you're talking about is, uh, from, a, from my point of view, is you're orchestrating access to resources through Ricardian contracts, in some sense. So as the contracts get more and more complicated, um, they're inevitably going to have bugs in them. Do you, uh, is there a way forward to edit contracts in progress that uh, have bugs? So for example, I, I can get into a hotel without paying, and, and I've, you've got hundreds of people already signed up to contracts like this. Is, is there a way to um, solve these kind of problems? Yes, and there's two approaches to it. One is that the way we test applications will change. Because when you have a fully distributed application, you need to simulate that. You can't actually test it the way we traditionally test applications. So that's one of the areas we're focusing on. The French, forget the institute's name, they've got a really good understanding of how do you test and simulate distributed applications. So one part of the answer is picking up bugs before deployment. The second is um, the reason why the C-Web has a transaction router is because we want to build ability to do 10,000 transactions a second, carrier grade. The only way you can do that is by commoditizing and simplifying the actual routing, which means that bugs get caught out 
and get thrown out as exceptions. So unlike a lot of the Bitcoin 2.0 projects where the governance of, say, Ether acts as a governance model for running the application, um, and then you have the distributed autonomous organizations and all of that coming through. Ours is much more a, a traditional distributed computing approach where bugs get uh, identified and removed down the track. What about if something like Y2K or, or Heartbleed turns up 10 years later? Is that game over? Uh, no, it's not because it's all loosely coupled systems. Um, and so there's no problem. The problem will be if there is a cryptographic um, problem with the protocols, not hard bleed in terms of server implementation because the computing resources are fungible, so it doesn't matter. Um, but if there is um, some protocol that we all use that fundamentally flawed, then we have to upgrade everything. Um, do you see the uh, the, the, the C-based um, system as a reward-based system? So will um, people be able to contribute resources or um, are these um, transaction routers, are they going to be managed by, by only you or you know, how, how's that going to work? So the C-Web will be an open source project. It will run just like any other open source project. It will be on GitHub. Um, people contribute. The license will be whatever a good open source license might be, including the transaction router. So anyone will be able to build C-webs. Um, they can build their own frameworks on top of that. Now, what will, the problem with these open source projects is taking responsibility to make sure that bugs get identified and resolved. So we don't want a hard bleed problem or um, where you have open source projects that die because no one takes responsibility. So we want to have a vested interest in to make sure that the business model allows for the C-Web to be open source but continue to be accountable and responsible for it. So yes, it'll be open source, but not left so that it is dying on its own. And anyone and everyone is, can build their own framework. That's how innovation happens because there's no patents, there's no royalties, it's all free. You just go ahead and build whatever you want to build. Yeah, I, uh, it sounds like the project's at quite an early stage. Uh, you mentioned uh, open source GitHub. Uh, it, what's the plan for implementation or for a proof of concept or for uh, coding this up? Um, it is really early days. Um, I, I apologize, I didn't introduce myself hugely. Um, I suppose many of the local people would realize that um, we, st we started this project basically in October, which is less than two months. And um, I got involved in it after I left. I was previously the chief executive of the Internet Party, and before that, Mega. So this is now full time two months. Uh, that's the progress we've made in two months. And by the first quarter of next year, um, we hope to have a prototype application, the C-Web specified and working, um, and everything out there. And I think speed is really important because that allows people to get involved. But because we're not building anything new except the transaction router, we don't have proprietary implementation periods. So it'll, it'll be public very quickly. Uh, hi. Um, so I've, I've heard it said um, many times that uh, you really can't, um, at least with blockchains in their current forms, you can't divorce the currency from the blockchain and, and the network because um, the currency is what provides incentive for miners to secure the network. Um, so am, am I correct in, in understanding that you don't have a currency behind this, and, uh, but you are using blockchains? How is the network secured? So that is the path that the Bitcoin 2.0 industry has chosen to go down. Pre-mining, proprietary cryptocurrencies, and that locks them into this incentives where all they do is to try and increase the value of their currency. And then any good idea that comes along which doesn't result in the increase of value of their proprietary currency 
And that just doesn't seem to me to be the future. Um, also, pre-mining is something that a lot of people in the community have revolted against as unjust enrichment of the founders, or at least the early people. And our view is that would the web be what it is today if that model had been adopted? And I think the answer is no. The answer has to be open and free, allow innovation and deliver value, not artificially restricting and pre-mining and an incentive that you know, Ether or Ripple coins or whatever, you know, I think that's a limited phase in the Bitcoin industry that will go away. They'll all interoperate. I think there'll be a thousand, you know, altcoins. There'll be all sorts of blockchains, and they'll all be interoperating with each other. I, I don't see a unitary future. Just don't. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, so you're using Ricardian contracts there, and uh, that's the base element for the open transactions project. Do you um, draw heavily from open transactions, or is there going to be any crossover with that, or are they a competitor? Um, open transactions, uh, and so we've been in, obviously in touch with Ian Griggs, who invented or sort of came up with the Ricardian contracts. Um, open transactions are slightly different. It's a really detailed answer on how it's different, but it is different. But it's most certainly something that we've been talking to Ian about. Yeah. But for those who aren't familiar, um, uh, Ian Griggs basically had a system called Ricardo, which, from which the term Ricardian contracts has come. And smart contracts is sort of a subset of Ricardian contracts. Ricardian contracts, you could say, is a smart contract that self-describes itself, whereas smart contracts tend to be um, very narrow, whereas a Ricardian contract could be pretty much anything. OK, any other questions? Have I lost most of the <laughs> non-technical people? OK, thank you very much.